taken from Matthew chapter 26, reading from verse 46 to verse 68. And it's at the time when Jesus is being in the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples, and he says these words. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a single signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father? and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels. But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? In that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place, that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these are bringing, men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spat in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Messiah. Who hit you? Amen. It's from Matthew 26, starting at verse 69. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a cock crowed. 
Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the cock crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Amen. Amen. Speak to me, friend. You know, Brother Gordon, he saves my throat on every other, every other week. I'm going to have to do something about that. I'll buy you a pack for Christmas, brother. Well, three packs. Thank you very much indeed. Well, we uh, will have been uh, reading through the reading. Uh, and I just remind you where we're at. We're in the middle of Lent. Uh, fourth Sunday. That's what we said earlier on, isn't it? We're in the fourth Sunday of Lent. And Lent is a time when we move towards the cross of Jesus. That's its purpose. Um, and some of us have given up chocolate. Some of us have given up sweets. Uh, some of us have given up Facebook. But that isn't really, it's part of Lent for some of us. But Lent is about repentance. Re Lent is about reconciliation. So that's what we're supposed to be thinking about right now. Are we right with God? Are we right with each other? That's, um, that's, is, is our thought process. And it's a very long reading, that's why I split it into two. Um, and of course our reading is about betrayal. That's, that's what it's about, isn't it? Um, you've got, following on from Stephen last week, um, betrayal of Judas and the climax of that betrayal as he comes and he kisses Jesus. Betrayed with a kiss. It's awfully poignant, isn't it? Judas, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I. Rabbi, he replied, you have said so. The Lord knew at all times where it was coming. And there is Judas. Come and kisses him on the cheek. Arrest him. Take him away. And that must have been him so cruel. And when we read about it, I know I read about it again and again. And we come to this time of Lent, it comes into our readings. Betrayed by a kiss. Betrayed by a friend. It hurts. And I know some people here know all about that. Being betrayed by a friend. But more importantly, Jesus knows all about betrayal. And if you're speaking to him and you are one that's been betrayed, the words of Jesus are powerful and true. At that communion feast, surely not I. Jesus and Judas sat down and shared bread and wine together in the knowledge of betrayal. Then it goes on to this kangaroo court. You know, um, I spent ever such a lot of time reading about what, what the proper court should have been like. There should have been um, proper charges. There should have been proper witnesses. There should have been two of every witness so everything could be verified. And you notice that reading there. There was only one came up. One witness, one person said. It was a completely kangaroo court. Jesus was betrayed by the, rule, the law of Moses. Our Lord has set out statutes. And at this kangaroo court, not one statute was obeyed. Not one. They couldn't have found him guilty because it's a rogue court. It was a sham. Justice had been set up. And friends, it reminds me, a lot of us are thinking about justice right now. Um, some of us, are with regard to the Methodist Church, what is justice? There was no justice for Jesus, even, if we, even though a system of justice had been set up. But the, the part that I want to focus upon is, is, G, is Peter. And I think Peter's betrayal is the most poignant because it can be each and every one of us. Each and every one of us can be, allow ourselves 
to be put into a place where we would betray our Lord. And I know several of us here would say, not me, never, not me, never, ever, ever am I going to betray Jesus because I love Jesus. And I hear that again and again and again. Peter loved Jesus. Again and again we hear that. There was no, it wasn't lack of love that caused Peter to betray his Lord and Saviour. Jesus knew. He'd said to Peter a long time ago that he would deny him three times before the evening had passed. And as, even as Jesus said it, it's hard um, to believe because Peter was the one who said, I'd die for you. I'd lay down my life for you. Peter was the one, do you remember, he walked upon the water. He was the one that said, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ. And what I want to, for us to think about is how many times do we put ourselves in a situation where we make ourselves vulnerable to betraying our Lord? Or is it that in our actions and our thoughts and our thinking, we're actually betraying him now? Some of us may be, possibly. I don't know. So let's set the scene of, of, of what's happening there. And you can pick up this picture from all the different Gospels. It's like a running commentary. You, in Matthew's Gospel, you don't get all of the story. You get some of the story. Um, and it's kind of fed in from the, the other ones. Um, they've taken away Jesus. And Jesus is facing trial. Um, and there's a compound that goes around. So P Peter hasn't run off entirely. He's followed on and... What we read in John's Gospel is, um, is the one of the disciples knew someone that was in the compound, so he'd been let into this, this compound. And I suspect he's gone um, to, to run after Jesus, um, to be close to him, and all of those uh, different things. And I don't know whether he could hear the trial going on. Perhaps he could, perhaps he couldn't. I don't know. Perhaps he could have heard the accusations being placed upon his Lord and his Saviour. But there he was in this compound. And in this compound, there's a little girl, basically, says, you're one of Jesus' disciples. What could that little girl do to him? Nothing. Nothing. She had the pa She didn't have the power. She was a little girl. She couldn't do anything. You're one of his disciples. No, I'm not. Fear starts going in there. No, no. And then when a man comes and says, "You are," I recognise your voice. There's curses uh, pulled down. He wasn't recognised once. He was recognised three times. A, 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 a guy called Sproul says. The Greek verb that is translated here as curse is related to the Greek word anathema, which means damnation. And what Peter was actually doing when he's cursing is, is, is pronouncing damnation onto all those who um, are around him, uh, who are saying that you're a follower of Jesus. He basically lets out a sorry of I know some of us are capable of doing that. And in Luke's gospel, Luke says he saw Jesus. He saw Jesus. I don't know whether it was a window. I don't know because I'm not there. But what we do know is that he saw the Lord. He heard the cock crow. And he broke down and he wept and he wept. That's in Luke 22, by the way. That must have been an awful moment, wasn't it? You know, you've gone chasing after the Lord. You've gone to give your support. And then all of a sudden, boom, and 
And then you look up and the words of truth hit home. Wept bitterly. Wept bitterly. I bet he couldn't take that out of his mind, you know. I bet it haunted him and haunted him. Some of us may be astounded at how easily Peter fell. He was part of the in crowd, wasn't he? Him, John and Andrew. They were, the, they were the guys. They were the solid ones. But he did fall. And friends, there's a lesson for us here in the falling of Peter. How might we fall? How might we become susceptible? How might we protect ourselves? We're in a period of repentance and reconciliation, yes? That's what we've been called to do, is we prepare for the cross. If it had been the rich young ruler, we'd have gone, hmm, because that's what happens to rich young rulers. If it had been Nicodemus, we'd have gone, hmm, because Nicodemus always was afraid of going in the light. But here, it's Jesus. Peter made some mistakes, it would seem to me. The first mistake that Peter made is he did not heed Jesus' warning. Jesus told him what's going to happen, and he told him when it was going to happen, and he still carried on. And it would seem to me in his word, and in our prayer life, and in our life, God speaks. And some of us listen, and some of us perhaps don't. And some of us perhaps say, well, actually, my way, not your way, Lord. The first thing that Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane, wasn't it? Shall we all pray? Shall we pray? That's a warning, isn't it? And it's an encouragement. And friends, I just want to ask you, as we go through a period of repentance and reconciliation, we're waiting for the cross and the freedom and the love and the eternity that it brings. What is our prayer life like? Do we pray? Are we on our knees at a night time or in the morning? Are we joining in the, uh, in, the, in the prayer group? Are we joining in our prayer triplets? When we have our fellowship groups, is it just that nonchalant bit at the end like when we, we perhaps do this, this and this? Or are we fervently praying? Peter fell asleep. Prayer wasn't on his agenda. With the rest of the disciples, what does it tell us in the Bible? Apart from me, you can do nothing. And friends, in our own strength, we are not strong enough. That's why Jesus said, pray and pray and pray and pray. Because without prayer, a week without prayer makes you weak. Yeah. We, uh, uh, you know, I thought you weren't going to be with me then. I thought you'd all gone. Oh, come on, John, hurry up, hurry up. The Bible tells us, we're to study. We're to study. That's what the Bible says. To, we're to study to show ourselves as work people, or work men, it says, who need not be ashamed. Do you remember that in 2 Timothy? We only did it a bit ago, didn't we? Yeah, we study. And we're told to hide the word in our heart. Friends, if it's gathering dust, you ain't studying it. If you're playing on your phone rather than looking at the Word, you ain't studying it. It's really abundantly clean, uh, clear. We're told to keep the Sabbath day. We're told to bring up our ch children in the way that we should go. And one of the things that happens in our Western world, it would seem more and more and more, is we start to think that we're smarter and we're wiser than the Lord. That happened right at the, right at the very beginning. Um, a great big tower was built, wasn't it? 
because they thought they were wiser and cleverer than God. Comes crashing down. We're not. Perhaps some of us think, well, how can God understand my situation? How can he understand what I'm going through today or tonight or tomorrow? How can he understand the pain that I'm in? How can he understand what it's like? Well, look, when we listen to the story of Jesus, he understands every single human emotion. He understands betrayal. He understands lust. He understands the, the desire for power. He understands every single one of them. He understands being lonely. He understands being afraid. He understands what you are feeling today. Don't think he does not. Peter had got himself into that situation of thinking he was better than everyone else. And it, it's, a, it, it's an awful trap, and I, I've, I've been there, and, and, uh, and, and I've, uh, I've preached, and I thought, that sermon was so good for little Flossie, it was so good because it addressed all her needs. Actually, it's so good for me. And it's so good for you. And it's so easy to displace from us and say, well, we're all right. We've got it right. It's good for them, good for them, good for them. But we forget it's also good for us. And Peter, I believe, had got himself, uh, unfortunately, into that arrogant uh, place where he thought... He, 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 he was smarter, he was thought wiser, he thought he was better than others. And we are prone to look at the failures of others, aren't we? Before we look at our own lives. And it, because it's easy to do. I'm going to pick on you, Sue. Oh, look at Sue there. She's not got matching shoes. Oh, yeah, I've got matching shoes, by the way. She's got <laughs> Do you know, I, this is a genuine truth. Um, I once went to preach at Emmanuel, where, where I was minister, and I used to have two pairs of shoes, and this is the surviving pair. And I remember walking on, and I had the old shoes on, <laughs> because I'd put them on, and they were different. And they noticed, and they mocked me. Anyway, there we go. Not that I'm bitter about it in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> but it, it, it is. Your shoes don't match. Oh, dear me. Well, see how that person does this, how that person does that, how that, oh, we say, oh, such and such, lives fall apart, oh, their marriages fall apart, oh, this and this and that. And it's easy to think, if only they were more like me, all holy and that, you know, uh, making sure I go to Bible, uh, Bible group and, and prayer night. And perhaps it's sexual sin. Perhaps it's about relationships. Perhaps it's about finances. Perhaps it's about spiritual fav uh, failure. Perhaps it's about being caught out in a lie because one or two of us do get caught out in lies. Uh, perhaps it's about addiction. Perhaps it's about all of these different things, a rebellious uh, uh, family member. And it is so easy to look at the problems of others because you are stronger. You are better, and you've got it all together. Well, that's Peter, isn't it? And how easily he fell, because his heart wasn't right. He wasn't listening. He wasn't praying. He wasn't putting it into perspective. Do you know, arrogant people tend to be lazy people as well. I'm not suggesting all arrogant people are lazy people. They forget to pray. They forget to study. They forget to put Christ first. And if we see one that's falling, there by the grace of God go I. There by the grace of God. I can remember, and it's a shame one of the old youth group, oh, well, Helen, you are here. Can you remember going to Cliff College with Lynn Peterson? Sorry, I'm picking on you. Well, you're talking to your daughter, sorry. Um, and uh, um, we did this little thing where somebody stood on a chair, and I know you've done it as well because we've done it later, Eve, and somebody stood on the floor. And um, the idea is to pull somebody up onto the chair with you, and the other one pulls. What happens? Shall I practice with Luz? No. <laughs> Fall down, yeah. Because 
it's a, it, pulling someone down is a lot more easy than pulling someone up. And I can remember doing that at Cliff. Um, oh, I can remember it, there was Wayne there. Mm. Anyway, don't matter. We can think about that another day. Um, uh, but it's a, uh, you know, and friends, we're called to be pulling people up, aren't we? And if we're pulling people up, they've got to be firm. They've got to be strong. And friends, where are you in your life? I heard about this um, Christian man. He went to work in in a casino, and uh, and when he, he he was asked about it, and he was asked about the wisdom of it, and he was continual. And he says, "I'm there to witness to the people. I'm g- that's what I'm going. I'm going to witness to the people that are there." And he had challenge after challenge after challenge. But there, later on. He found that this man also developed a gambling addiction. And friends, there by the grace of God go I. Don't think yourself so arrogant that you won't put yourself in a place of danger. Don't think yourself so arrogant that you can't keep going into places without study and protection and prayer. And friends... We often put ourselves in tempting situations. And friends, if you put yourself into tempting situations, do not be surprised if sin grabs hold. I don't believe anyone falls into sin and disgrace because they want to. No. I, don't, I really don't believe it's anybody, a Christian person's desire to go, Vroom. we don't. In disgrace because we let our card down. Because we cease doing the things that we're told to do. Because we're not in that, that right place. As I move to a close, um, and we do need somebody, we do need uh, somebody that's going to run and tell our young people, "Come on, it's time to dish out some flowers." Um, in in a few seconds, can you imagine that scenario? Right at the end, Peter goes back, doesn't he, to the disciples, and he says, "Listen, guys, this is John um, ad libbing. Listen, guys, I've got it all wrong." Listen, guys, I've gone and denied Jesus. Listen, guys, I'm broken and weeping. One of the next times we see Peter, he's preaching to the multitude. And thousands are being saved. Then we see him later with his Lord. And what? Fishing, basically. And eating fish and being forgiven. Friends, if your God has come down, take courage. Be open and honest with the Lord. Be open with him. Do you know those who tell lies to God come away from God? Those who tell the truth to God draw close to him. Friends, you know if you're in a time when you need to repent. You know if you're in a time where you need to be reconciled. And I suspect on this journey to the cross, there'll be one or two of us that need to alter our thinking, alter our prayer life, and point ourselves in the right direction. Amen. We're going to sing. Let's get the band back together. You forgive us. You make us like brand new. And Father, we thank you that we stand in the shadow of such love that forgives our sin and restores us to fullness of life. Father, we take our offering today. And Father, we offer it to you. Father, as part of our worship, as part of our sacrifice. And Lord, we pray that you would use it so that your kingdom would grow. 
we pray, Lord, for those people who may be receiving a little bunch of daffodils from somebody who's received one today. And we pray, Lord, that your love would touch the heart of those who need it. And bless us, Lord. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Please be seated.